Danny joining us this evening. Um, obviously one of the most important and influential voices uh, in the Irish business community. So a really good opportunity, I think, for us at the Institute, but also for you know, the members of the uh, Young Professionals Network to get a chance to listen and ask some questions. Um, if this is your first time to the Young Professionals Network, I'd like to welcome you. Um, if you didn't get an email about it and you found out about it through a friend or Facebook and you'd like to be on the mailing list and join up to the uh, YPN, um, just send me an email at kian.mccarthy at iia.com and I'd be more than happy to sign you up for future events. Um, but uh, I'm just going to hand it over now to Danny McGoy. I'm sure everybody has a pretty good idea of who he is. Um, he's the CEO at IBEC, the representative body of Irish businesses. Um, previous to that, he had worked in the ESRI and the Central Bank and has also held some post-teaching in Oxford, Trinity, um, DCU. Um, and as I said, he's a very important voice in Irish business, so we're really happy to have him here. So I'm just going to hand it over to Danny, and then we'll have a question and answer session after. Thanks very much, Keen. I'm given it small enough, I might actually stay uh, sitting down if you don't mind. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, first thing I'd like to say, I'd really like to encourage this young professional network. I think it's a crucial initiative to have you know, people who are interested, but also the kind of the, the intelligent minds that you bring to the problems of uh, our society. And I'm going to mention some of the problems tonight. Um, they're a better class of problem. Uh, these are affluent problems, but they're problems nonetheless, and may um, require more innovative solutions than some of the old thinking uh, that my generation have brought. Because one of the features of the generation that's currently holding kind of the incumbent positions in our society is one that was kind of rooted in a very narrow, small open economy, uh, grateful for anything kind of uh, economy, and finding it very discomforting uh, to be where the Irish economy is right now. And I'm going to give some of the facts around that. Um, those of you who might have um, heard me speak before is that I tend to use quite a fair bit of uh, data in a way like a drunk uses a lamppost, you know, <laughs> more for support than for illumination. But hopefully there'll be some illumination as well. Um, so as King Connolly uh, introduced me, um, I've been an economist for about 30 years, uh, both in academic teaching and research institutes. And in fact, I'm old enough to um, have been in the ESRI in the early 2000s where we kept missing the boom. <laughs> Uh, we'd say there were 30,000 houses built in the 45, then we next year said we'll get caught again, we'll go, we'll go 49, it came in at 71, and we missed it all the way up to 93,000 houses. Um, and of course, we're in a very different context today where we're still, you know, depending on who's measuring, um, we have a much bigger population, much bigger demand for housing, and yet we're probably about a quarter of that kind of housing stock, just as one particular measure. Um, and I might you know, in a kind of an incoherent way, I might just throw out some, some kind of stats that I think that um, might be interesting to see Ireland as a kind of a very different economy right now, one that is actually dealing, I would contend, with the problems of uber affluence. Right? That really sounds very strange, given that we've had a diet of austerity, uh, you, know, the, you know, everybody had a keeping down with the Joneses kind of thing going on for a while. And suddenly there seems to be a break where there's a keeping up with the Joneses uh, phenomenon coming. So you know, the Irish are very mercurial, you know, easily overjoyed, easily depressed, and uh, treat both conditions with alcohol. Um, so the, that dichotomy, I think, is kind of catching people out. I think the economy is in, what my title of the talk is, is a model of substance. And uh, I use the word substance very deliberately. Uh, for a phenomenon, I think a phenomenon that um, we haven't fully grappled with is the fact that Ireland is, is now a resource economy. And I'll try and give some expression to that and what resource I'm talking about. So to kind of peel it back a little bit, um, to give the kind of my version of where I think Ireland got here historically and why we're a particular peculiar um, outlier in Europe and how that may manifest itself in some of the kind of big future of Europe debate, which I think is the crucial theme. And this is why I think this group and this network is so important because I think this is the frontier. Uh, we need to start thinking about that future of Europe and Ireland's role and leadership role 
uh, in that future of Europe. But first we must look at our past. And so the unique thing about Ireland and the unique thing about generations of Irish people and Irish citizens is that we are fairly unique in the world. I think we're the only place on earth to have a lower population today than in the 1840s. Um, so there's 1.1 billion people in 1841 when the census was taken. And the island of Ireland, as everybody in Ireland knows, was over 8 million people, just a little bit over 8. What people probably don't know, there's only 17 on the island of Britain on the same census night. So that if Ireland now had grown uh, in the same pro rata, there'd be 32 million of us on the island of Ireland. And today, with North and South, we're still shy of seven. So it's pretty unique in a depopulation story. Now, the corollary of that, of course, is you've got a huge diaspora, which you know, we, we say is a great thing to have, and it is a great thing to have, but actually it's a, it's a second-order good thing to have, if you think about it. You know, it's kind of a failure in many ways, is that you, yeah, you have a lot of migrants uh, out there, but it's actually fundamentally an economic failure. Um, so that's always a good place to start, you know, as economists, have a bad base. <laughs> and so it's one of the things that uh, I've enjoyed in IBEC. I, I became CEO in the summer of 2009, and it was bad. And so people used to send me mass cards rather than congratulations um, for taking on the role. But actually in 2009, with my economics hat on, I could see that the turnaround had already occurred. Okay, so let me just kind of unpack this a little bit. We depopulate. We are correlated. I'm not saying by causation, but we are absolutely correlated with the United Kingdom, which is a big comment about Brexit. The correlation between our two societies is that Ireland in the 20th century pretty much underachieved in the way that Britain was in its decline uh, during the 20th century. And in fact, for those who kind of ignored, and lots of Irish people do ignore the United Kingdom uh, willfully, uh, failed to recognise that the 1980s turnaround, both joined the European Union, that's clearly important for both societies. Uh, and remember, the reason why Britain joined is because when they went to the beaches of um, Spain, they noticed that you know, the Germans and the Italians were wealthier than them, and they couldn't figure out, like, in you know, one generation, how these people who lost the war and were supposed to be devastated had more bling. You know, had better watches, better cars, better living standards. And they kind of went, what's going on? Why have we, you know, lost out? Maybe something got to do with this European Union EEC kind of lark. And that's, that's an important point I'll come back to, because I think that may be something that will emerge in your lifetime, in your professional lifetime, the next uh, 10 to 15 years, as to the want to come back piece. Um, so when you go into the uh, 1980s, very transformative was the whole Thatcher revolution. This infiltrated Ireland in a way that's never really acknowledged. And I would argue, and there's only a proposition, that Ireland actually has got right-wing tendencies. It doesn't have any left-wing tendencies of any significance. Um, sociologically, Ireland is more a petty bourgeois, right-wing, Christian kind of country. <laughs> And that involves things like petty bourgeois are obsessed about property rights and the use of the education system to change social class, right? So having set off in Tume CBS, it's great to be in a Georgian house, <laughs> nearly in Belvedere, right? <laughs> um, not quite there, but near enough to Belvedere, a kind of a, an iconic uh, school. Um, so in that kind of right-wing petty bourgeois use of education, change social class, this was very much a function of our agrarian society because the thing that gave rise to the depopulation uh, was not that we had the famine. Yes, that was a bad thing to happen, but we haven't starved for 200 years, right? Um, so a massive event, really searing event, but in itself could be overcome. Um, that doesn't explain the depopulation. The, the depopulation is explained by missing the Industrial Revolution. And the reason why the island of Britain gets exponential growth is it's obviously the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, no small part of this kind of sociological uh, musings that I'm having right now is that the north of Ireland actually does have a little bit of industrialization and it has a manifestation of, of bourgeois and proletariat. 
um, in the way, and particularly on religious grounds, um, you would see quite a significant landowning bourgeois who use education, but actually use it on the other island, go to be educated in Britain and never come back. And then a proletariat that was connected now three generations, four generations away from the actual industrial hub of shipbuilding and textiles, but not using education in a way that the Catholic petty bourgeois, just like their fellow uh, Catholics in the South, have used it in the North. Right? So just kind of leave that kind of hanging out there. But it's a, you know, sociology can tell a lot. Um, I had the advantage of taking one module on uh, sociology uh, in Galway back in the mid 1980s, and it was our current president, Michael D. Higgins, that uh, taught it to me. And as a 17 year old, I was particularly fascinated by there was a chapter on deviance, which there wasn't much deviance material in Tume in the 1980s. So I was a particular student of this chapter. So I, I can officially say I learned my deviance from the President of Ireland. So <laughs> anything I say here can be, uh, can be attributed to uh, a bad education. But on that kind of sociological interpretation, that, that had manifestations more recently as to why the Irish didn't burn the bondholders, why, why the Irish weren't revolting uh, and rising up. It's because uh, sociologically, Irish people are a bit like the bull McCabe in the fields. They're absolutely, absolutely properly right nutters, right? <laughs> Get a big stick and start wielding around if anyone starts to come after their property rights. And that, that aspect means that that virtue or that uh, flaw, depending which way you look at it, means that Ireland is great for globalisation because you can trust the Irish not to steal your intellectual property or your tangible assets if you're a, an Intel or a Microsoft or a Pfizer or an Allergan, the people who make the Botox, all the Botox in the world is made down in Westport, for instance. You, you're, you're pretty sure that if you go to a board of directors and say, you know what, I have an idea, I'm going to put our most valuable product and I'm going to find you know, a fairly peasant island um, on the edge of Europe, um, and I don't think these guys are going to steal it. That seems a low hurl. That's a crucial hurl. You know, you think about going to the edge of Russia, still a member state of the EU. The, those countries, while they're evolving, Historically, they still have an ambiguous um, history around property rights and between swings between communism and collectivism and so on in a way that people underestimate that sociological underpinning of the Irish business model, which is, for all economics, clear property rights. Who owns it? Is it transferable? Is it enforceable? Is it exclusive? Is it universal? These are the absolute underpinnings of all economics. Not taught enough in our economics course, but the underlying principles of any contracts and so on is that pristine property rights issue. And so, huge advantage to Ireland and to Britain is this property rights and non-codified in a world that's changing. I'll come to that in a moment as well. Common law is actually a great advantage that you can interpret given the way a world is changing rather than being stuck in a codified system. So you get to the mid-1980s, and Thatcherism has a number of, of, of facets here. All I'm getting at is that Ireland is correlated with the United Kingdom. I'm not saying it's caused. In fact, I think they're both caused by something different, which is globalization and being ready for it. But just for instance on Thatcherism, our trade unions, our left, um, basically looked at what was happening to their sister unions, because the trade union movement tend to be two island type structures, certainly in all island in the case of Congress. And they could see that their trade unions were marginalized by Thatcher in the great miners' strike of the early 1980s. And so the Irish version says, we'll be extinct here in the way our colleagues in Britain are unless we find another way. And the other way is social partnership. The idea to have influence by being involved in a kind of a centralized wage bargaining tripartite structure that became social partnership. And social partnership, for all its ills, had a really good mechanism at its heart. And what it did was it anchored wage expectations in a way that they're not anchored today. And I'll kind of come to today in a moment. In the absence of having some kind of social dialogue or structure, having some kind of norm set for wage expectations or for the distribution of resources around the labor market, we run into some kind of trouble. And I kind of articulate that as well if you 
I'm just kind of conscious of time, so put yeah. your hand up at any stage yeah, and, and I'll stop. So the British influence, if you track what happens in Britain, and I like to kind of say something nice about Britain, apart from the madness on which they've now gone on to, is I, I left Britain in 1996. I left uh, University College London. Um, and as Keane said, I'd lectured in, in a couple of places, Oxford and, and another, which, which was City of London Polytechnic, which became the London Guildhall University, so it's kind of the spectrum of the universities. If you told me in 1996 that British universities could stay in the top 50 universities in the world, I'd have made the biggest bet that I could muster at that time, that I would win, that Britain would not manage to stay. I'd give you Oxford, Cambridge, but they wouldn't be in the top 10. They were in terminal decline. And Thatcher seemed to have given them the debt now by making all the polytechnics, uh, universities as well around 1989, 1990. So it devalued the currency as the uh, elite universities felt. Everybody could call themselves. So UCL, where I was, was particularly perturbed because there's now a university of central Lancaster. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I forget what it was called as a polytechnic. But today, in most league tables, you will see that British universities will be four of the top ten. Oxbridge, UCL, and Imperial College, and they tend to rotate. And in fact, you know, if you get into the top five sometimes, depending on the particular ranking on any given day of the week, you could even see three out of five can be British. The others being usually American, Harvard, Stanford, the usual suspects. City of London, the financial institution, never is really long history in a world that's much bigger and much more globalised, has it ever been more dominant? Even when Britain was the empire, it is now by far the global city for finance. And, and London itself, even though short time since I left in 1980s, and I hope that's not correlated, my leaving and it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's emerging, um, is really a metropolis of, you know, it's one of the global hubs. It actually is far superior to anything in the United States. Right, it really is even taken like the wonders of high-rise New York. New York does not compete actually with the breadth of which uh, London has a globalization, true globalization footprint. So London, contestably, up to up to the point of Brexit, could actually be the number one city in the world in terms of any measure of globalization that you might want to put together in some kind of weighted average. And then the world sport that is football. I didn't mean to come here to give the <laughs> pro-British uh, view of the world, but what I want to say is our story is very correlated. The, the good things I'm going to say about Ireland are really correlated to this. Is that football is the world sport. And, and now there's no place more peerless in terms of the money. You know, when I was younger, in the 80s, Italian football was really big and German football was coming for a while and then fell back. Then Spanish football was the big place for a while. You know, Europe seemed to be moving around and the British just kind of hoofed it around the place in a big muddy field. And Irish players got to play in big clubs. Irish players, unfortunately, now can't get within any essence of the Premiership because it's truly global. And the money is there and that thing's gone stratospheric. And what you'll find is the common denominator in all these kind of three bits is globalisation. And, you know, not just British people, but the fact that lots of people come be it to the city or to the universities or to the Premiership League. But probably the greatest achievement of Britain was their Olympic performance. Like the fact that Britain came second, only 65 million people in a near 8 billion world, with BMOTs like China and India and Russia and you know, Brazil, to come second in the Olympics is amazing. You might say, well, sure, they're all on drugs, but they were all on drugs, that's the point. Everybody, it wasn't a, it wasn't a unique national characteristic. They're good. When they get going, they're good at stuff, right? And so they're going to be a big loss to us because the correlation we've had with them is that both islands became hubs of globalization. And so in the, in the recent times, kind of getting up to the point I wanted to talk about, this substance idea, is that Ireland started to move up the value chain some of you are too young, but if you were around in public discourse in the year 2000, you would really have a pain in your derriere from hearing the words, we need to move up the value chain. We, need to move, you know, we can't be doing call centres. And so the good news is, for your generation, is that Ireland has moved up that value chain in a way that's just been spectacular. And, and in a way 
that our official measures of activity don't capture this new economy. So the capital deepening, the capital labour ratio, the capital deepening that went on in the last 10 years is unsurpassed, I would contend, in any country. I'm not talking about Ireland's history. It's nowhere near, there's nothing comparable in Ireland in the last 10 years in terms of the amount of capital intensity, in terms of the machinery and so on that's gone into the factories that IBEC represents. And IBEC, at the start, as you said, represents Irish business, but because the business footprint in, in Ireland is so global, uh, IBEC is actually, of its type, the biggest representative organisation in Europe. And I was just saying to Keane that this is actually acknowledged in Brussels more significantly. We, we launched the Future of Europe document, which we'll come back to the Institute to do a bit more of. Um, and so who came along was the President of the European Parliament, Jani launched it, and the summing up was Barnier. And in between, so we had Commissioner Katainen and Commissioner Hogan also contributing. And the reason is that the business model in Ireland is a very potent symbol of the success of Europe in a way that we have to start giving expression to a lot more. And what I mean by that is everybody talks about Ireland kind of being the poster child for austerity. That's actually to miss what actually happened. Right? It's a convenient coexistent narrative but actually it's not actually what occurred. Uh, what occurred is this kind of build of globalization to the features I talked about, about the societies and sociology. The missing the Industrial Revolution is great. If you can miss out on it, it's bad for the generations that went before. But if you're the modern generation, you're not dealing with brownfield sites. You're not dealing with proletariat, working class communities that you know, have built up lots of angst over lots of periods of time with lots of social unrest. So in other words, you're not dealing with the north of England, right? You're not dealing with some of those pressure points that became expressed through Brexit. You're dealing with kind of greenfield to move to the next phase, the next generation of industrialization. And so Ireland has moved from 2000 up the value chain into this industrialization. Now, unfortunately, here in Dublin, there's both a Dublin guilt and a Dublin ignorance going on about what's happening in the rest of Ireland. All right. The guilt is, you know, we're rich here up in Dublin. You kind of think, you know, the towns down in the west of Ireland is, you know, tumbleweed going down because the shops are closed and the post office is closing down and, and people have emigrated and their parents think they've gone to Australia but they've actually just come to Dublin, right? <laughs> um, they went to Australia for about six weeks and they've returned. Um, so it is clear that the west of Ireland is, is flatlining in terms of population and some counties have, have marginal decline and it's gangbusters on the East Coast. And that's something we've got to deal with as a society. We need to spread that around and can, and can do that. But what's been missed in Dublin is the industrialization of the western seaboard. If you go to any so size town on the western seaboard, and if you don't know this, don't worry about it because it's a, it's a blissful ignorance of media Ireland and official Dublin Ireland, is you go to any uh, sizable town in Ireland, you will find a major industry, and you won't find a major legacy industry, you'll be looking at cutting edge industry. So last Monday I went to Letterkenny. Letterkenny is absolutely humming. It felt to me like the Galway of the 1990s. Got significant companies there. One is called Primerica, 1,300 people. Zeus across the road with 400. Uh, United Health, which is changing its name to Optimum, I think it's somewhere in the order about 800 and also expanding now in Dublin. Um, Medi size company in the MedTech. Uh, you know, so in one industrial park, and I didn't go downtown to see other kind of multiplier industries. And it's kind of captured because it's got a good letter to Kenny Institute of Technology, you know, it's good, people want to live in their community, a lot going on, and it's near a city like Derry, it's quite close, etc. And most Irish people wouldn't know the fact that Letterkenny is much further from Sligo Town than it is from Belfast. What's your geography like? Do you think Letterkenny's beside Sligo? <laughs> Psychologically, I kind of think it is up there somewhere. Um, is that the heartlands of where you know, economic activity is happening. If you come down the western seaboard, you come down to Sligo or Donegal Town. Donegal Town is a small town. Abbott, really huge industry. 
Abbott split into AbV and Abbott, so Sligo's got AbV, and these guys that do the inner tubings for medical devices, which would go around the Earth and the Moon, I think something like eight times if you had all the, their production of inner tubing in, for the world uh, per annum. Amazing kind of factoids of industrialization. North Mayo, Allergan makes all the Botox in the world, Baxter, Coca-Cola make all their concentrate there, and Coke have put in the most state-of-the-art. It's like a Dulux factory. If you, the next phase for Coke is you will choose what type of Coke you want. So you won't be just offered Diet Coke or the three, whatever versions. You will go with like the Dulux paint, the pressure buttons, and if you want it to be more, it'll be worse than coffee. You'll be choosing the various combinations, and they will make the robotics that you can imagine in the production process of that. Um, it might, just to stop there maybe, in my hometown, which is Tume, uh, Tume de Valera back in the 1930s, when we didn't have industrialization, tried to force an industry into the west of Ireland, a sugar factory, right? Why you would pick sugar? No natural growth of sugar, beet, and, but you know, you forced a socioeconomic. At its peak, 200 people worked in that factory, at its peak. The Tume Herald, which reports, I get it every week, its editorial kind of still talks about that. You know that Tume has been left behind because the sugar factory has gone since 1992 or something. And yet all the pages of people going out to socialise is from a company, one company, there's a few of them there, but one company called Valio. When I lived in Tume, it was an embryonic, it was called Connet Electronics. Valio is a French company which took over the Irish company. It does the onboard systems for parking your car, the cameras, the sensors. 1,200 people work there. Population of Tume isn't much bigger than when I lived there. But that factory is 1,200, not 200 people. And it's not the only company. And Galway is just down the road, which is the European hub now of medical devices. Industrialization has happened on the western seaboard. It's kind of unknown to Dublin. And therefore, why would you put any infrastructure over there? Why would you connect up the second and third biggest city with a motorway, for instance? There's nobody over there. What would they be doing with it? Uh, between uh, Cork and Limerick. Finally, they've come around to it. But actually, you've got to take the <coughs> orbital motorway system around because a society is not just about commerce. Ireland has succeeded with lousy infrastructure. What would it be like if you actually had modern infrastructure? And, and motorway is 20th century stuff, right? So it feels like you know, people say, oh, don't build roads. Build broadband. The answer is do both, right? Because a motorway is actually about society as well. It's about grandparents being able to see their grandchildren in two hours, not to have to take off with an eight-hour trip down to Dingle um, and trying to work out what hospitals were along the way in case uh, <laughs> you, you lost the where to live or your, or your health. So on, the, on that kind of premise, sorry, i gone on a bit long, I'll just finish off on this, is that we had the seeds of a great flourishing and we're building up and we're becoming a wealthy society in a European context. We're moving into that kind of better end of the European member states on the back of hard yards, capital, labour. And we used our structural funds, as you know, for education, not for motorways, unlike the Portuguese and the Spanish and the cohesion. Now we don't have the motorways, so we need to kind of counteract that and get back. You know, we did the education piece first, which was good, good smart, track talent. But what was the game changer? And this is the game changer about this resource to end on this point, is corporate taxation thing that we're you know, guilty of as a crime. So I think about it, thought experiment. If the Iron Islands suddenly becomes wealthy, right, and they're blinging all over the place, they're helicoptering in, they're going on great holidays, and the University of the Iron Islands of Inish Moor is going up the university rankings, uh, you'd say, how the hell do they do that? There must be a crime going on out there, right? That's what people think about Ireland. Like, how do these Irish depopulate it, you know, in contrast even to their northern brethren up to the 50s and 60s were so poor and continually making mistakes and crashing their economy every now and then? How do they suddenly take off? Because when I Google Ireland and I'm in the Czech Republic or I'm doing my fourth class project down in uh, Montevideo in Uruguay, I know nothing about Ireland, but the teacher asked me to, you know, when I, was, when I was in the 1970s, you used to write to the embassies and they'd send you a poster or something. You know what I mean? It was kind of like a three or four week gig. You'd, you had to find out something about Uruguay. There was no place to find <laughs> out. You uh, worked out there might be Uruguay, you know, 
consulate in London, you have to write to them and hope they send you something, and then you come back with your homework about five weeks later. Now in this Google world, you put in Ireland, you do this later on tonight, put an income per capita ranked. And if it's modern, if it's, if it's up to date, you will find Ireland in the top 10 countries in the world in income per capita. And you kind of go, well, I know the others. You know, that'll be the United States and Germany and Denmark. Not at all. They're way behind. The other countries you'll find in the list will be Macau, Brunei, Qatar, Monaco, Luxembourg. And it's kind of inconvenient for people who have been poor and have a kind of poor mouth. So we find yourselves in this grouping. And then you kind of go, I don't know, those figures must be wrong. So don't like the numbers. We will get a new measure. But the problem is, when you ask the Irish households, and we have asked them in the last year, tell us how much you spend every week. So we give them a household budget survey, because we're trying to get the weights for the consumer price index. Uh, we give them two weeks uh, diary, 10,000 households over the full year. So it's a really the best kind of sample you'll get. It's not just a box pop, it's, it's really significant. We underreport our alcohol consumption, but you can correct that. <laughs> you know, we only seem to drink about a quarter of what Guinnesses are producing for the whole market. But anyway, um, when you get over our, our biases, we spend a lot on coal, we heat the house well on a, on a technology we don't have anymore. But anyway, um, they love the coal in Ireland. But what they also uh, bring forward is uh, income. So self-reported Irish households, uh, now two years ago as it happens, uh, 1,100 euros per week is the average household income in Ireland, disposable income. 1,100 euros. The average household is 2.8 people, so call it three. So it's about 20,000 euros per head, regardless of whether it's three years old or 65 years old. Now put that context of looking for four or five euros for water charges against the 1,100 on average, just to give you the sense of naughtiness between not being able to reconcile our situation with reality, is this is why we're in this top league. The question then is where did the money come from? And the money comes from the model of substance. Because what happened in Ireland is that with the OEC, this is all got, to, Ireland's success is everything got to do with Starbucks. All right, so you, you guys now have got a line of things that you're going to be interesting in the pub after this with. Starbucks is the big story for Ireland. And nothing got to do with Starbucks in Ireland. In 2012, Starbucks in the UK were shown to be paying no corporation tax to the British government, yet they're opening a shop, you know, a bit like in The Simpsons when Homer goes into one Starbucks shop and there's another one opened up across the road. He, he crossed the road, wasn't on there, and he wasted his time crossing over. One had opened up. You had the same phenomenon going on in, in, uh, in the UK. They were everywhere, but paying no copper tax. And then, thankfully, the executive in Starbucks did something that has changed our lives in Ireland. They decided to give themselves a self-administered tax amnesty. They decided to write a check, I think for about 17 million sterling, and metaphorically, but nearly literally, cycled past the treasury and threw it in the front door. There was nothing to say what it was for. It was just money sent in. It didn't say it was because we made this amount of profit. It was just a check. And this egregious behavior gave rise to Osborne and Cameron saying, this has now gone too far. We're going to have to do something about corporate taxes globally. And Obama was a willing participant. And so they got the G20 to agree to do something about corporate taxes. They asked the OECD, which is quite an unusual move. The OECD have no great taxation uh, pedigree to do the work. And this became known as base erosion profit shifting. And we were, in IBEC, were involved in this. And I know nothing about accountancy, even though I did a commerce degree, but I wasn't very good at it. Um, and I went to these meetings in Paris. I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that it was going to be an absolute game changer for Ireland because what was happening was you have to show substance where you've got your tax strategy. And so you couldn't show that in the Bermuda Islands, you couldn't show it in the Cayman Islands, it wasn't big enough and it wasn't part of the European Union. It didn't have any cred. And it also didn't have globalization, it didn't have a common law legal system, it, didn't have, it did have a common law legal system in the Caribbean. It was a British dominion. And where do you go if you have to go somewhere with substance? You look around, the European Union looks like the richest place on earth. Lots of customers there and they'll be off your back. 
So head for the European Union. And where to land in the European Union? Land where they speak English and where it's uh, Anglo-Saxon and where it's easy to lift and shift. And they've got a common law legal system going back to the property rights, Ireland and Britain. And so the two beacons that were in attracting this type of mobile capital was Ireland and Britain. And so I'll give you an example of something that didn't happen, uh, by way of an example, is Pfizer. Pfizer is one of the top 10 companies in the world. Pfizer attempted twice in the last five years to become European. Twice has attempted to become European. First of all, it attempted to become British through the Asterix Zeneca deal by inverting through the Asterix Zeneca. Vince Cable, in his great wisdom, uh, decided to put the mockers on that in the coalition government. And Cameron and Osborne have initially been cheerleaders backed away because of the general election coming. Pfizer in 2016, attempted to become European again by becoming Irish, through going through Allergan, the people that make the Botox, and Obama changed some of the tax rules just before the, the election, which stopped Pfizer. So Pfizer nearly became an Irish company, bringing its balance sheet here. But Pfizer was the only one that got blocked. The others have come. So for instance, Ingersoll Rand is an Irish company. Accenture is an Irish company. Medtronic, huge beam of the medical device companies Irish. In 2015, the corporate balance sheet in Ireland, in that single year, when Tronic and some of the aircraft leasing companies, all came in to Ireland in 2015. This is intangible assets, but it is substance. In the modern world, this is actually more valuable than oil. Because oil can run out, it's exhaustible by its, its nature of its properties, Intellectual capital is not exhaustible. It can be renewed, it can be enhanced, it can be renewable. That balance sheet increased by 40% in a single year. 40%. And a balance sheet growing by that has an extraction of P&L, which becomes a flow measure, which is GDP. Irish GDP increased by 34%, not 26. 26 is what economists talk about, the volume. The in money, where business people live, what was the money growth? It was 34%. So the economy grew by one third in a single year as a result of finding this modern day equivalent of oil. And what do we do as a society? We decide to disown it. We don't like the measure GDP anymore. We want a GNI star. Even though GDP is the legal mechanism to measure an economy, it is what we had the European stability mechanism, which was to respect the European fiscal rules, which in themselves are driven off the ratios to GDP. So while it might be inconvenient to use GDP, it is actually, constitutionally as well, if you take it to its full extension, what underpins our measures of what we um, have to do in our European uh, context. Normal economies can't grow by one third in a single year. Economies that find a resource can and do. And so when you find a resource, you've got to behave differently. You cannot allow the resource, like a family winning the lottery, it'll destroy you if you don't know what to do with it. If you know what to do with it, you can make generations wealthy, even though the initial windfall is kind of passed through. You make yourself smarter, you have infrastructure and so on. We are in that cusp right now. We have found the modern day equivalent of oil. These are intangible assets. Just like oil, they could, they could run out, they could move location. And therefore, you've got to take that money and behave like a resource economy. You take the money, put it into a sovereign wealth fund, and you do stuff like, one thing, buy your way up the university rankings. It is absolutely unconscionable that a society as rich as Ireland is allowing its universities to slide all the way down in the university rankings for the want of money. It's an easy proposition. You buy your way up. You work out what the metrics are. It doesn't mean you're, the IQ of the country goes up or anything like that, but it is a measure. Um, you know, we could even bribe our way to win the Eurovision if we uh, you know, could get into the military um, um, way. So, sorry, I'll stop at that point. But just to say, the tragedy is we are blowing this massively. Uh, I am incredibly, having been optimistic when nobody else was. I'm incredibly pessimistic right now. I'll recover. I'm just feeling really bad because I'm observing in the last few weeks 
the mother of all splurges. The amount of conspicuous consumption in terms of being out of the country on foreign holidays and not near shore holidays, really expensive stuff and very expensive holidays, and the extent to which we're only past quarter one, and I know people who are on their third holiday, the week skiing after Christmas and the week during the midterm, and then of course with the weather event, which also took another week out of the production, and the costs are rising, and we are losing competitiveness. And so what, what happens to society is that when you find the oil, the oil sector can afford higher wages, higher rents, and that absorbs those costs in the product, in the productivity. So it doesn't pass it on at higher prices. Those who live beside it have to compete with them for workers, for rents, have to pay the higher costs, can't absorb it in productivity, they don't have it, have to pass it on higher prices, become uncompetitive, and then everything becomes disaster when the good stuff runs out you're left with a, an economy that's uncompetitive. Unless we do something dramatic about taking the money and into the infrastructure. And what do we get? We had a great plan. What have we heard about it? The spin, the closing down of the strategic communications unit. Are we certain that anybody's actually doing the bit that's supposed to be done? Like the last comment I make, our now current Taoiseach got very annoyed at me one day when he was virtuously as Minister for Health saying we'll be the best children's hospital in the world, it'll be paperless. It's also currently childless. You know, you gotta do, you gotta do stuff and do it fast. And when you're this rich, and we are this rich, you gotta stop worrying about efficiency. You've gotta become effective first. Efficiency is a second order issue. I can guarantee you I would build the most efficient children's hospital in the world on paper. I just wouldn't build it. <laughs> but it would only cost a half a billion when I cost everything. When you live in the real world, you've got to actually do it and put up with the fact that it's going to be three times the cost because that's where the world is going right now. We don't have people. Ireland is running out of people. And so part of our construction is we'll have less of the real stuff and it'll cost more. But you know what? We still need the real stuff. Sorry, I went on way too long, but there you go. <laughs>